Welcome back to another episode of Chinese Swords and Swordsmanship. In this episode, I have this really unique, I think perhaps one of a kind, Chinese Qing Saber. I'm Scott Waddell here at the Great River Dawa Center, home to our Academy of Chinese Swordsmanship. Naturally, if you think about the vast majority of sabers in any country, particularly a country the size of China that has hundreds of thousands of men under arms, they're going to be made by a pattern. In fact, all weapons, armor, everything for the military is going to be made according to regulation. But of course, throughout Chinese history, there are professional martial artists, people who wanted to follow the way of the sword, who would have had unique swords made for them. And of course, also, if we think about China being such a large country with such great variety of regions, you're going to find there are differing local customs, sometimes unique weapons, and of course, different styles of decoration on everything, including the weapons. This particular Dao does, has a number of features that really make it appear to be unique and one of a kind, uh, both in its hilt, the way it's mounted, its decoration, and particularly also its length and weight. For example, it's 31 inch long blade, that's 79 centimeters. Your average chink saber the period would be more like 28, 27 inches. So that means this is three or four inches longer than your average sword. It has a seven inch long hilt with 18 centimeters. Uh, it also is particularly heavy at two pounds, 13 ounces, almost a full three pounds. 1300 grams. This is really quite a heavy saber. Right? It really works the arm to, to wield it. It's a, at least a good 50% more than your average Qing saber that would have weighed in for about two pounds on average. While it is particularly heavy, again, about 50% heavier than the average sword of the period, it's not quite as difficult as to wield as you might think. And that is due in part to these very heavy iron fittings, which work to counterbalance the blade. So while it definitely works your arm, it doesn't do it in such a way that really pulls quite as much as you think. It's definitely more demanding than your average Qing Saber, but it is not really say, impossible to wield. Anybody with a good amount of training is going to be able to handle this. And again, I think that tends to hint at who this might have been made for. Not your average person, not your average soldier, but somebody who was a really trained martial artist. Also, when we think about these fittings, they're rather specialized. I mean, typically, of course, if you're wielding your sword, you're looking to cut the duifang out at arm's reach, out at blade's reach. You want to employ your edge, not your fittings, to defend yourself. But these fittings really look like they were made to be struck with, to hit with. Even the guard, I mean, obviously this heavy iron pommel, that could be used to strike like hitting with a hammer. It's really a solid piece and it's quite large. When we look at this guard, this multi-lobed guard here, again, if you think about it, it's rather specialized. It's not a typical shape. More commonly, they're rounded. But if you're thinking of getting in close and striking, however you'd be hitting with this, that lobe would do a lot more damage hurt obviously a lot more to be hit with that than it would a rounded guard. Of course, being hit with either would hurt quite a bit. Which makes me think this sword is being specialized for somebody who expects to use their Dao in close. So that was either their method of fighting, but that doesn't really quite make sense when you think about such a long blade. Who would have had a sword that you could cut with so powerfully, but also was designed to be used to strike in close? So I'm thinking, probably somebody in some sort of protection services. Of course, during the Qing period, there were a lot of caravan bodyguard services. When you transported goods between cities, you had to take your own bodyguards, your own caravan guards with you to protect your goods to make sure they got where they were going. There were also, of course, bodyguards for wealthy men, for high officials, and also every city had a magistrate that employed constables. And their job, of course, like police today, would be to keep security, to keep the peace in the city. And you can imagine any one of these sort of professional swordsmen, professional martial artists, they have a, you know, they have a unique sword because they're in that kind of position where they, it's the tool of their trade. But if they, coming through town, cut somebody to move them out of the way, 
that's going to either create more trouble, probably going to get them in trouble, and is not really what they're looking to do. On the other hand, if you use your pommel to sort of move people out of the way to protect your, the official you're escorting or to, to settle a street fight, you're less likely to have trouble, less likely to create more trouble than if you use the edge. So that's kind of my thinking as to why this sword has these really big, heavy iron fittings and how they would have been, been used. The other really interesting thing about this sword is the decoration here at the fort of the blade. It's a dragon's head with its mouth open like this, and it's very nice. It's on both sides. It's carved in with very simple sort of lines here at the fort of the blade. And it's not, of course, the kind of decoration sort of carving we would expect to see on, a, say, a Qing officer, a military officer who is purchasing a sword and wanted something a little special above, you know, above and beyond what the average soldier would have. Those sort of chiseled works you see on other sabers, that's not what this work is. This is very almost rustic, very provincial kind of work. And again, I think that speaks to it not being a specialized sword or a custom-made sword for a Qing officer, but for a local martial artist, perhaps a bodyguard. If you have other ideas, please share them in the comments. I'm always interested in hearing what you think. Until next time, thanks and zaijian.